Hi, my name is Michael Cohen, and I'm the director of the Pe Pediatric Hearing Loss Clinic at Massachusetts Eye and Ear. And I'm so excited to be talking today about ENT problems in Myrie syndrome. And I would certainly like to thank the Myrie Synd Syndrome Foundation for this opportunity. Uh, I have, uh, for my financial disclosures, I have a sponsored research agreement with uh, Medell Corporation, uh, which is a company that manufactures hearing aids and cochlear implants. So first of all, I would just say that ENT problems are common in Myrie syndrome, and there is sort of a broad spectrum of problems that we do see, but the most common problems, uh, which I'm going to talk about today, are hearing loss and airway stenosis or narrowing. And so we'll start with hearing loss. And you know, hearing loss is a problem that has several different types. And to better understand the different types of hearing loss, it's helpful to look at the anatomy of the ear and understand how hearing actually works. So this is a diagram of the ear and, um, and all of its working parts on the inside. So this is the external ear and we have the ear canal, which leads up to the eardrum. And behind the eardrum is an air filled space called the middle ear. And the middle ear has three tiny little bones that connect the eardrum to the inner ear. And the inner ear consists of the cochlea, which is the organ that allows us to trans translate those sound vibrations into a nerve signal that goes to the brain. Then we have the balance organs. There are the semicircular canals, which are up here, and those help us uh, perceive and maintain balance. So hearing loss is divided into two main categories. The first category is conductive hearing loss. And conductive hearing loss happens when there's a problem somewhere in the external ear or the middle ear. So that could be a ball of wax in the ear canal, it could be fluid behind the eardrum, or it could be a problem with these three tiny bones of hearing. And then there's something called sensory neural hearing loss, which is a problem with the inner ear, the cochlea, that organ which translates those vibrations into a nerve signal, or with the nerve of hearing itself, which comes out of the cochlea and leads to the brain. And so conductive and sensory neural hearing loss are the two main types. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about what those mean and how they manifest and how we treat them. So the first thing is it's very, the, the way that we figure out if hearing loss is there is with a hearing test. And so we'll talk about how these different hearing losses look on the hearing test. So this is the basic plot of an audiogram. We have numbers at the top and those numbers represent different frequencies of sound moving from low pitch up to high pitch. And then there are numbers in this vertical column and that represents how loud the sound has to be for the patient to perceive it. So we have a very quiet sound here and a very loud sound down here. And so the right ear we usually represent with circles. And if the audiogram is in color, then it's red. The uh, right ear is red and round, which is an easy way to remember it. And the left ear is blue uh, if it's in color and always represented with little X's. And so in a patient with normal hearing, this is what the hearing test would look like. We have all these little circles for the right ear, the X's for the left ear. And for every different frequency, those responses are somewhere above 20 decibels. This is sort of the cutoff for normal hearing. And normal hearing is really anywhere in this range, you know, above equal to or above 20 decibels. And when we start to see hearing loss, we can classify that as mild hearing loss, which is 20 to 40 decibels down here. Moderate hearing loss, 40 to 60. Moderately severe, severe. And when he, there's no response, uh, even at 90 decibels or louder, we call that profound hearing loss. So here's an example of someone with significant hearing loss. The responses are pretty normal at the very lowest frequencies, but we quickly see that the hearing loss goes down into the moderately severe to severe range. And again, we call that a, a moderately severe to severe hearing loss. But we talked before about conductive and sensory neural hearing loss. So how do we tell the difference between those things? All the marks that I've shown you so far on these hearing tests are what we call air conduction testing. When that's done, a probe is put into the ear right here and the sound is presented to the ear in the normal way that sound gets there. And so that's what the patient would hear if you were talking to them in a room, you know, or, or uh, just sitting next to them. But the other way that we test hearing during a hearing test is by placing a device behind the ear that vibrates. And that sends sound vibrations directly to the cochlea, cochlea without having to pass through the middle ear. And so if you look on a hearing test and see these little brackets, uh, or sometimes these are represented as greater than less than signs, that's bone conduction testing. And that's that testing with the little oscillator that goes behind the ear and bypasses the middle ear. So this is an example of a conductive hearing loss. We know it's conductive because there's a hearing loss. We see these levels are down in the moderate hearing loss range when we're going through the ear. But if you put that little oscillator on and go through the inner ear directly, the responses are in the normal range. That means there's a blockage somewhere between the inner ear 
and the outside world. And again, that could be fluid, could be a hole in the eardrum, could be wax in the ear canal, any of those things. In sensory neural hearing loss, these little brackets tend to line up with the X's and O's. That means no matter how you get the sound to the inner ear, whether it's through the ear canal or behind the ear, the response is the same. That tells us that it's the inner ear or the cochlea that's not working. And that requires a very different management strategy. This is an example of a six-year-old with Myrie syndrome. And what we see here is these little brackets, or in this case, it's a little greater than less than sign. These are up in the normal range, but down here in the low frequencies, the responses are in the mild to moderate hearing loss range. And this is a very typical pattern of hearing loss in kids with Myrie syndrome who often have a conductive hearing loss, and in particular, low frequency conductive hearing loss. So what are some of the common causes of conductive hearing loss? Well, uh, the most common would be middle ear fluid. So these are images of eardrums. This is a normal eardrum. And you can see this eardrum uh, looks very healthy. Uh, it's translucent. You can see areas of shadow behind it and areas of brightness. These are those little bones of hearing I was talking about. This is the malleus bone, the incus bone, and the stapes bone. Those are the three smallest bones in the body, and they're all right behind the eardrum. And here's an image next door, which shows a child that has middle ear fluid. So in this case, it looks kind of fuzzy and blurry. That's that cloudy appearance that we see when there's fluid behind the eardrum. And you can actually see there are little air bubbles here. And so those air bubbles represent uh, just an air fluid level. So there's some fluid and some air behind that eardrum. And this usually would be associated with a mild hearing loss when we see this kind of fluid behind the eardrum. Now, what does it look like when there's an ear infection? Well, if this fluid uh, or mucus behind the eardrum becomes infected, it gets red and swollen and the fluid turns white. This is pus behind the eardrum. You see there's all this swelling, there's redness here. You can see these blood vessels brightly on the surface of the eardrum. And this is what it looks like when we have an ear infection. And these are very common conditions in any child uh, and certainly in children with Myrie syndrome as well. Typically for an acute ear infection, we would treat it with uh, oral antibiotics. Um, but in kids that are having recurrent ear infections, um, we can consider ear tube insertion. So this is a, a short video that shows ear tube insertion or tympanostomy tube insertion. And what we're looking at is the eardrum here. And you can see that we are using a knife to make a small incision in the eardrum itself. And now we are suctioning out all that mucus and fluid that was trapped behind the eardrum. And this is just a small tube that's made of Teflon that's inserted through the eardrum. This tube is really tiny, that opening in the tube it's just a little more than a millimeter across, but that's all you really need to get good ventilation and to prevent that fluid from reaccumulating. And this is very effective for kids that have chronic fluid, particularly if the fluid is causing a conductive hearing loss. Uh, we're able to remove that fluid and then the tube stays there to prevent the fluid from reaccumulating. And in many cases, hearing loss due to the fluid goes completely back to normal just, um, just by inserting these tubes. This is also helpful for kids with recurrent ear infections to prevent the ear infections from happening in the first place. And the general guidelines for tube insertion would be children who have more than three infections in a six month period, or children that have chronic fluid behind the eardrums for a period of three months or greater with an associated hearing loss. So in those cases, tube insertion is reasonable. And you can see you know, just how rewarding it is to get all that fluid out of there. But the main question would be, should kids with Myrie syndrome have ear tube insertion? Well, the argument for ear tube insertion would be ear infections are uncomfortable. Middle ear fluid can cause hearing loss and, and hearing loss can cause speech delay. And these are all really important factors. What's the problem with tube insertion then? Well, we know that in children with Myrie syndrome, there are concerns about anesthesia uh, for a variety of reasons, including airway stenosis and also um, just cardiac anomalies, which can be common uh, and other anesthesia risks. And then there's also the risk of scarring. We know that children with Myrie syndrome are prone to progressive fibrosis, and that can happen in the skin. It can happen in the mucous membranes. The eardrum is made of skin on the outside and the mucous membrane on the inside. And so what, what, is, what is that risk? Is there a risk of scarring of the eardrum? I will say I've seen a number of children with Myrie syndrome who have had ear tube insertion, and even sometimes before the diagnosis of Myrie syndrome was made, and it's gone uneventfully. The tubes have gone in, they've come out, there hasn't been scarring, they, they've done their job. Uh, but you know, these, these risks remain sort of undefined. And so it brings us to the question of what, you know, what should the overall recommendation be? And you know, I generally say that tube insertion when necessary is fine for kids with Myrie syndrome, but we should have a higher threshold for tube insertion, meaning 
I wouldn't necessarily put tubes in right after that third infection. You know, if the infections are responding to oral antibiotics, if they're not causing that much distress, it's perfectly reasonable to continue to manage recurrent ear infections with, with medicine, with antibiotics in children with Mirey syndrome, as opposed to tube insertion. And if you're going to proceed with tube insertion, it's really important to have an experienced team. You want an anesthesia team that knows about the specific risks associated with Mirey syndrome. You want to have a preoperative anesthesia consultation. You want cardiac consultation. You want to make sure that any issues that the child has that relate to Mirey syndrome are addressed and known prior to the start of surgery and as we make that decision. So, um, you know, I think that's really the key is to just have uh, an open conversation that discusses the potential risks and, um, and, and allows for mitigation of those risks during any surgery that might happen. And aside from fluid, there are other causes of conductive hearing loss and there can be abnormalities of the bone of, uh, bones of hearing. There can be abnormal pressure behind the eardrum. There can be structural abnormalities of the inner ear. And so for children that have a normal ear exam, but still have conductive hearing loss on exam, we would often consider imaging with a CT scan of the temporal bones uh, or the bone that the ear is contained in in order to look for those anatomic abnormalities and determine uh, potential treatments for those things. As we talk about sensory neural hearing loss, uh, the management is certainly different from conductive hearing loss. Conductive hearing loss, it's usually a physical or mechanical problem that you can fix. Sensory neural hearing loss is a totally different problem. And we'll talk a little bit about how sensory neural hearing loss happens. So this is what the cochlea looks like in diagram form. This is that uh, organ in the inner ear that turns sound vibrations into a nerve signal. And it's a spiral shaped organ that's lined with thousands of tiny little hair cells. And these little V's here are the tips of those hair cells that are embedded inside the cochlea. And when fluid inside the cochlea moves back and forth in response to vibrations from the eardrum, those little hairs on the end of the cells will change their position. They'll vibrate back and forth. And that results in the cell sending a nerve signal to the brain. The brain interprets those nerve signals and it uh, results in the perception of sound and hearing. But in sensory neural hearing loss, those hair cells are missing or sometimes even gone. You can see uh, this is a cochlea where there's been severe uh, damage of those hair cells and those little tips are, are damaged or missing. And this results in failure of that signal to be transmitted uh, to the brain. So this is what it looks like in sensory neural hearing loss. So what kind of hearing loss do we see mostly in, in Mirey syndrome? We actually see mostly conductive or sometimes mixed hearing loss, which would be a combination of conductive and sensory neural. But most patients with Mirey syndrome who have hearing loss have conductive hearing loss. In fact, in one study that looked at 32 patients with Mirey syndrome, only 12% of patients with hearing loss had a purely sensory neural hearing loss. And um, among adults with hearing loss, uh, if there was sensory neural hearing loss, it tended to be slowly or gradually progressive. So we don't always tend to see a very significant or severe hearing loss. Often we see a mild hearing loss that gradually progresses over time. So how do we manage hearing loss? And you know, management of hearing loss can, can affect, this, is, this is relevant for both conductive and sensory neural hearing loss, but if you have hearing loss that won't go away with medical or surgical treatment, we have to manage that uh, in, in specific ways. And so first there are resources available to children with hearing loss. Uh, early intervention services are available to children less than three years of age in all 50 states. And um, contacting early intervention services can be extremely helpful in terms of getting services established. They can help you identify infant and toddler programs uh, and other, and other um, resources for families with hearing loss. It's important to follow the hearing and have regular hearing tests. Uh, particularly for kids with Mirey syndrome, it's reasonable to get hearing tests every six months. And I usually say until about you know eight years of age or till third grade uh, for six month intervals of hearing loss, at which point if the hearing has been stable, it's reasonable to switch to annual hearing tests. The rationale for that is that once we have established um, classroom environments, once kids are old enough to sort of share their personal experience to let you know if they're having a perceived hearing loss, we can sometimes stretch out the frequency of that hearing testing. But always, if there is a perceived change in hearing, if a child is complaining or relating that their hearing has gone down, don't wait for the next scheduled hearing test. Get a hearing test at that time uh, so that we can appropriately manage it. What about in the classroom? So appropriate interventions would include preferential seating uh, or strategic seating close to the teacher, assessment of the classroom to optimize the listening environment. We wanna have carpeting, we wanna reduce ambient noise. We want to make sure that doors are closed so there's not hallway noise. Uh, 
There's also um, a, a very helpful system that we can use uh, called an FM, or, or nowadays it's sometimes referred to as a HAT, or hearing assistive technology system, which involves uh, the teacher wearing a microphone. And then there's a speaker in the classroom, or uh, sometimes a device worn at the ear level, which takes the, the teacher's voice and puts it, um, makes it louder and puts it directly into the ear. And all these accommodations should be specifically defined within an IEP or a 504 system, a 504 plan. Uh, we want these things written down. We want to make sure that, um, that, that someone is checking on these things and they're actually happening. And one very good way to do this is to have a consultation with a, uh, a teacher of the deaf or an educational audiologist within the classroom environment. I typically recommend that this is done once a year to optimize that listening environment. Uh, school, public schools often have um, either a, a professional that works for the school district that does this or a contract with someone in the community who can come into the school and do these consultations. And this can make a really big difference, not only for optimizing the classroom environment, but also for uh, just educating the teacher about um, appropriate strategies for communicating with kids with hearing loss. Another thing that I like to talk about is protecting residual hearing. You know, if you have a mild hearing loss, you want to avoid other potential causes of hearing loss, such as noise-induced hearing loss. And so I generally recommend for uh, loud environments, and this can be, you know, a loud parade, a concert. Um, this can be even uh, a, a loud movie theater. Um, hearing protection can go a long way. In fact, there are many kids who are uncomfortable at movies because movies at the theater can be so loud these days. Uh, and as, um, as, as certainly as we emerge back into the real world as, as the COVID pandemic is winding down, this is even more relevant. Uh, some kids actually find it more comfortable at the movies if they're wearing over the ear earmuff uh, style hearing protection. Um, but also with, with music and listening devices, these can become very loud and, and almost all of the personal listening devices have the ability within uh, their settings to set a volume limit. So you can actually go into an iPhone or an iPad and you can go in and you can choose volume limit and you can actually set a maximum volume. And most of these devices at maximum volume can actually produce a toxic noise level, which is it's best to avoid. Uh, so if you, if you put that setting at that volume limit at about you know, 70%, 75% of the way across, you're gonna be at a safe level, even for prolonged listening. So this is something that can be helpful. What do we do for kids where these accommodations aren't enough? Well, we can amplify the hearing with hearing aids. Hearing aids today have a lot of features which are, are really nice. They uh, are digital, which means they're easily programmable. They have clear sound. Uh, they are often uh, uh, include Bluetooth connectivity, which means you can stream music directly to your hearing aid. You can stream an FM system directly to a hearing aid. The newest hearing aids have rechargeable batteries, so there's no more fighting uh, to find uh, to fit in those tiny little hearing aid batteries and, and to keep them uh, in stock in your home. Um, and, you know, hearing aids come in many colors and many styles and the ear molds can be customized and, and, and kids, you know, actually find these to be really cool uh, these days. It's, sometimes it's seen more as a piece of style or sort of like a, a cool Bluetooth headset uh, than a medical device. And that perception has certainly changed quite a lot over the years. Uh, hearing aids are great for children that have a normal size ear canal and normal bones of hearing and, and amplification that can work that way. But there's some kids where the ear canal is very narrow or the bones of hearing have a problem. And so for kids with conductive hearing loss that can't be corrected surgically and that doesn't work well with a hearing aid, we have bone conduction devices. And these are things like uh, Bajas and Pontos and, and other implanted devices. And there are a wide variety of these, but you know, these have very different, um, they, they have different features among the different devices. And this is really a complex topic that in a child with a, a significant conductive hearing loss that can't be improved surgically or medically, this is really an important thing to discuss with your ENT and audiologist as to what the best bone conduction option would be. And then as we reach the point where, uh, where we get to the level of profound hearing loss, um, cochlear implants are a good option. These are special um, surgical devices that are implanted within the cochlea and they actually go into the cochlea itself and electrically stimulate that nerve of hearing. These are for those patients where the hair cells are gone completely. And no matter how loud you turn a hearing aid, the patient is gonna, isn't going to hear it. And so cochlear implants are an amazing development that can be helpful for these conditions. So we're gonna change subject here a bit and talk a bit more about airway stenosis. So what is airway stenosis? Stenosis means narrowing. 
And airway stenosis can happen anywhere in the airway. And the airway is anywhere from the nose all the way down to the, the, the bronchi, uh, way down deep in the lungs. But the most common type of airway stenosis that we see is something called subglottic stenosis. So this is an image of a normal larynx. The larynx is the voice box. And these are the vocal cords. The vocal cords we call the glottis. And the space below the vocal cords, which you can see is wide open here, is called the subglottis, that area of the larynx right below the vocal cords. And so that's a normal larynx. This is a larynx with subglottic stenosis. So you can see here, these are the vocal cords and they look normal, but below there's this tiny little opening and all this pink stuff is scar. This is narrowing of the airway below the level of the vocal cords, leaving behind this very tiny opening. And we call this subglottic stenosis. So what are the symptoms of airway stenosis? How do we know if someone had, had, had airway stenosis? Well, the, the hallmark of subglottic stenosis or airway stenosis um, below the level of the vocal cords is strider. Strider is a high-pitched, noisy breathing that, that can sound really scary. It sounds like the, the sound of a seal barking. Uh, it can sometimes present with a cough, that barking cough. Uh, airway stenosis can present with recurrent croup. And recurrent croup means, you know, croup is, a, is, a, is a, a barking harsh cough that happens due to a specific viral illness uh, that causes swelling below the vocal cords. And it usually lasts for a few days and then goes away. Croup usually happens once or maybe twice and then never happens again. But in kids with recurrent croup, meaning you get a croupy cough or that barking sound and strider every time you get a cold, that's recurrent croup. And that needs to be evaluated because uh, it's not normal to get croup every time you get a cold. Once or twice, sure. But if you get croup every time uh, you get a cold, that's a big problem. Exercise intolerance. So kids that get noisy breathing or audible wheezing every time they run or move around, that's a, that's a hallmark or a potential symptom of airway stenosis. And then, you know, for stenosis that's higher up uh, at the level of the back of the throat or the nose, sometimes you can have snoring or obstructive sleep apnea. In fact, that can occur with any type of uh, airway stenosis, but even airway stenosis that's higher up can result in nasal obstruction, chronic runny nose or mouth breathing. And all these are things that should be evaluated. So how common is airway stenosis in Myrie syndrome? Well, Laryngotracheal stenosis, or that stenosis below the vocal cords, um, in one report, looking at 32 patients, was present in 15% of cases. None of those cases were congenital, meaning these kids all acquired the airway stenosis, they weren't born with it, and it was variable in severity. Another study looked at four cases of Myrie syndrome with airway stenosis that occurred over a 33-year period. All four of these patients had had prior endotracheal intubation. What, what is that? That's when a breathing tube is put into the throat, usually during surgery. Uh, one of the patients had a breathing tube that was placed and not through the mouth, but actually through the nose. We call that nasotracheal intubation. And that child, had, that person had developed coanal stenosis. That's a narrowing of the airway at the back of the nose. This is a normal opening at the back of the nose. And on the other side, you can see this is completely start scarred down. This is an example of coanal stenosis. So because people with Myrie syndrome are at risk for airway stenosis at multiple levels, this, this is an example of nasal airway stenosis. And of these four cases uh, where airway stenosis occurred, two of those patients were dependent upon a tracheostomy or a tube in the, in the trachea in order to breathe and maintain the airway. So how do we manage airway stenosis? One option, if it's mild, is just observation. Some kids get uh, a croupy cough when they get a cold, but they're otherwise fine and, and that's okay. We can just observe that. Then there's medical management. So some kids get a croupy cough when they're sick, but they get really croupy and have a hard time breathing. Sometimes those cases can be managed with respiratory treatments, uh, sometimes a trip to the emergency room to give uh, steroids and, and breathing treatments that are not available at home can be helpful. And then there's surgical treatment. So the least invasive surgical treatment would be something called balloon dilation. And in that case, a balloon is passed through the airway to the point of narrowing and that balloon is inflated. And it looks really nice and clean in this diagram, but in real life, balloon dilation often results in re-scarring. Sometimes we use a laser to cut through portions of the scar before doing the balloon dilation. And again, there's a high risk of recurrence even in, that, in, in those types of procedures. And then there's something called laryngotracheal reconstruction. That's where we actually widen the airway. So this is an example of one type of laryngotracheal reconstruction where an incision has been made in the front of the airway and the airway has been opened or widened into this elliptical shape. And then a piece of cartilage is actually stitched into that space to, to widen the airway and to open it up. Um, and again, in Myrie syndrome, one of the major problems is that you can do this surgery, you can have a really great result, and then six months later, you can have scarring back down. So, you know, in short, 
airway stenosis is easier to prevent than it is to fix. Once you're starting to do balloon dilations and laryngotracheal reconstructions, you're, 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 you're already in a tough place. And so what, what are the recommendations for how to prevent airway stenosis in, in, in patients with myriad syndrome? First of all, it's important to note that any prolonged airway manipulation can result in stenosis in people with myriad syndrome. That can be a breathing tube that's passed through the mouth and is resting in the windpipe. It can be a tube, a breathing tube that's passed through the nose and is resting in the nose. Any tube that's sitting for a long time, and a long time could even be, you know, just a couple of hours during surgery, uh, can create a reactive uh, scarring and stenosis. So we want to avoid endotracheal intubation when possible. It's just, it's a, it's just a matter of fact that some people with myriad syndrome are going to need surgery. And so, but if we can do it without a breathing tube, that's a better option. So if it's something that can be done with local anesthesia, if it's hand surgery or knee surgery, often we can do that with local anesthesia. Uh, you can do what we call sedation, which is MAC or monitored anesthesia care, where there is no tube put into the windpipe. There's something called a laryngeal mask airway. Sometimes we need anesthesia that's deeper than sedation, but you can protect the airway with this, with a flexible mask that goes over the voice box, but not into the windpipe. And that's called an LMA. So that's something that you could use for, you know, a more complex or longer surgery uh, that doesn't need direct control uh, of the, the airway itself. Uh, and that's a really good option um, to use, for example, tonsil surgery or adenoid surgery. Often we can do that with an LMA. But if a breathing tube is absolutely necessary, we want to make sure to use the smallest tube possible. And Breathing tubes often have a cuff at the end, which seals the tube into the airway. And that cuff is often the spot where the stenosis or narrowing happens because it's common to inflate that cuff with air to create a, a good seal against the windpipe. And that pressure is what can cause um, the actual scarring or stenosis. So number one, use the tube that's as small as possible. If you can use a cuffless tube, use a cuffless tube. If you are gonna use a tube with a cuff, make sure you're careful about how much pressure is in that cuff. You wanna use as little pressure as possible to maintain a seal and to check that. And the most important thing is the anesthesiologist needs to be aware of all these things. Myrie syndrome is rare and not everyone has heard of it. And so you wanna make sure that a conversation occurs with the anesthesiologist about all these risks. And most importantly, not just the anesthesiologist who starts the case, but sometimes in a longer case, Someone, another anesthesiologist may come into the room to give a break or to transition care. So every anesthesiologist that's going to be caring for the patient needs to know about this problem, needs to know not to put a whole bunch of air in the cuff, needs to know, know about maintaining this airway. So everyone has to be aware of these potential risks. And I think that's the key. It's going to be the case that some people are going to need surgery, but if we can do as, as little and as minimal manipulation of the airway as possible, we can reduce the risk of airway stenosis due to these things. So in summary, hearing loss and airway stenosis are common problems in Myrie syndrome. These are also manageable problems and preventable problems. The absolute key to the best outcomes of these problems is communication in advance. When we're discussing whether to do an intervention, it's important to take these things into consideration. When we're planning to do an intervention such as surgery, but before we've done it, we want the team to meet, to discuss, to meet the patient, to review the history, to know about Myrie syndrome. And then if there is going to be surgery, we wanna review all of these things on the day of surgery, go through the potential risks, talk about the ways we can limit those risks, talk about who's gonna be in the room and how they're gonna be made aware of all these risks. And finally, to participate with multidisciplinary teams, um, teams that, are, that work together frequently will communicate better and teams that take care of kids with Myrie syndrome and communicate about airway problems and things like that are going to be aware of how to manage these things. So, what, what are the next steps for figuring out how to manage these problems? I would say, you know, the, the best directions for hearing loss and airway stenosis is to learn more about them. Our knowledge is relatively limited at this point. We want to learn more about the patterns of hearing loss. We want to know about the types of hearing loss that exist in Myrie syndrome and track them over time. And we want to also analyze who gets airway stenosis. Are there kids that are more likely to get it based on the genotype, the, the specific mutation that's resulting in Myrie syndrome? and what sorts of interventions are most likely to trigger these things. And over time, as we collect more data, we can review and analyze these things. Uh, this, these are just the websites for our multidisciplinary clinics at Mass Eye and Ear. We have a multidisciplinary hearing loss clinic and air digestive clinic that manages these sorts of problems. And if anyone has questions for me, uh, this is my email address. Please feel free to email me directly. I'm happy to answer any questions or, or to talk about this.
I'm sorry my talk is recorded uh, and so I can't take real time questions uh, about this topic, but I'm happy to uh, respond to anyone that may have any questions or comments or concerns or suggestions. So thank you so much for your attention today. Uh, it's been my pleasure to present on this topic and I hope everyone has a, a great remainder of their conference.